Well, okay, welcome everybody uh, to this session today uh, of uh, the Philosophy of Physics Research Group, the Symmetry Group, the local group, as well as, of course, the Beyond Space Time team <coughs> that's on the Templeton project. Uh, as part of that Templeton project, we have uh, also a visiting program, and Giuliano Tarengo from uh, the University of Milan is visiting this week. And I'm very happy to announce his talk today. It will be, as I'm sure many of you are aware, a double header. So we will have the first 45 or so minutes devoted to, to your talk, mm -hmm. including Q&A. And then we'll switch to Chicago and have um, the talk by James Reed from the University of Oxford uh, being Skyped here. Uh, so please uh, join me in welcoming Giuliano Torengo on the experience of the passage of time. Thanks. Thank so, thanks Chris and the project for inviting me and thanks for being here and it's also people in Chicago for being there. So let me start uh, uh, from uh, 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 what I take it to be an object connection between uh, our experience uh, of, uh, of time and the uh, central issue in the metaphysics of time. So we can say that uh, uh, experience makes manifest to us uh, the passage of time uh, as, as a feature of the world as we experience it. So we'll say that uh, uh, experience makes manifest to us uh, a dynamic feature, T, let's call it T, of the world as we experience it. Uh, given that, then we can formulate two positions in the metaphysics of time, one which can be labeled the realist position, uh, which oftentimes uh, uh, takes the, the shape of uh, uh, what is called the A-theory of time, uh, which roughly says that uh, at the fundamental level, or objectively speaking, uh, T is a feature of reality. And uh, the alternative position, the antagonist position, the anti-realism, uh, that uh, uh, according to which, uh, at a fundamental level, reality doesn't possess T, but merely appears to possess it. Now, uh, I think that uh, the interesting questions are precisely uh, those uh, metaphysical questions, uh, but uh, today's talk will be mostly devoted to uh, the philosophy of mind point of view, so to speak. So, in particular, uh, I want to give an account uh, of what does it mean that experience make manifest to us uh, T. So what, is, what does it mean for experience to make manifest to us uh, a feature such as T? T. Okay, so let me start uh, with two pre-theoretical distinctions that will help us to understand what exactly the theory uh, is about. Um, so. Uh, the distinction I want to draw, draw is between uh, the ordinary belief that time passes, the common sense belief that time passes, uh, a, gr a grasp of which I take uh, to be uh, trivially uh, entertained by everyone, and uh, uh, which is, so we can say, which is part of common sense, uh, of, of the common sense narrative about reality. And so it's part of experience only in a broad sense of experience, once encompassing uh, our cognitive life at, l at large, so to speak, abstract thought, memories, and the like. And uh, uh, so the, the belief I want to distinguish from the feeling that time passes, namely the experience as of time passes, which is a, a part of experience in a stricter sense, namely uh, in a sense that includes only presently occurring mental episodes. From now on, when I talk about experience, uh, I will talk about experience in this second sense, strict sense. Now, as I said, those are pre-theoretical distinctions. I'm sure that uh, whoever is uh, 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 familiar with the literature on the, uh, uh, on the topic knows that uh, uh, um, already talking about the existence of a feeling of the time passes, the feeling of the passage uh, might be taken not to be as a uh, uh, theory neutral uh, way to speak. Uh, so I'm aware of these, and uh, my point is that there is a way to pin down uh, so a notion which is, which is as pre-theoretical as possible. Uh, so the idea is that uh, among our beliefs, uh, ordinary beliefs, there is not just the belief that time passes, but also that uh, we believe that time passes because we feel it passing. So the idea is that uh, 
whatever I want to give an account of whatever experience in the stricter sense play this role. So play the role of being such that uh, uh, it is uh, because of having it that we uh, believe that time passes. Okay? And I think this is to be a very neutral way to talk about uh, uh, um, the experience. So it's a very neutral way to, to ask the theoretical question, which is uh, what is the status uh, or the feeling of time passing? In particular, to anticipate a little bit things that we will see in a moment, uh, uh, the idea is that uh, uh, it could be a specific uh, feeling, a feeling uh, that is, uh, uh, as it were, of pure passage, which is distinct from uh, the feeling of uh, uh, experiencing uh, qualitative change or motion, or it could be, in some sense, reduced to the feeling of change or motion, or also, it could be that, uh, well, we are actually, we believe that time passes we, 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 because actually we mistake some other feeling for the feeling of the passage of time. So when I ask this theoretical question, I want to be, uh, I mean, I'm asking what, what's going on here with respect to the feeling of the passage of time without assuming anything as much as possible uh, about the feeling of the passage of, uh, pass <coughs> passage of time, only that it has to fulfill this role. So this is the only way to pin the notion. So having said that, let me also fix some uh, uh, terminology that I'm going to use uh, in uh, uh, explaining the various theories and defending mine. So uh, um, experience is not, uh, we, we talk about experiences uh, not just in the broad and stricter sense, uh, as I explained before, but when we talk about experience uh, in the strict sense, uh, um, we can talk about uh, uh, token experiences, so uh, concrete events, mental episodes that uh, uh, each of us uh, uh, has, or type experiences, um, which if you want you can thought of as uh, classes of such uh, uh, um, token uh, experiences, uh, individuated through two features, uh, namely what I call the phenomenal character, the what it's like to have an experiences of a certain kind, for instance, uh, uh, take a visual experience of something red. Well, you can you can you know uh, uh, individuate a, a type of experience as uh, an experience of uh, uh, that has the phenomenal <coughs> character, which corresponds to what it's like to experiencing visually something red, seeing something red. Okay. And uh, the representational content. Uh, so, uh, what the experience? Uh, represent, namely what, uh, uh, if you want, what the experience represents uh, uh, in terms of the, uh, how the world is like according to the experience. Of course, uh, the, the relation between those two things uh, is controversial and uh, um, people, uh, like well, a position in philosophy of mind is uh, it's called representationalism and basically uh, according to such position, uh, Phenomenal character is uh, uh, supervenient uh, on the representational content or uh, identical to the representational content. Uh, uh, but in general, uh, 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 no, as of now, I don't want to make any assumption about this. Okay. Uh, if you're puzzled about an example of uh, a phenomenal character that doesn't correspond to representational content, uh, well, there are examples such as uh, uh, an, uh, you know, a pain in the wrist. Uh, it could be you know, an experience uh, which is a, a bodily pain is an experience that uh, has a, you know, what is like to have that experience, but that doesn't have a clear representational content. Or maybe a, a mood, you know, being in a certain mood has a certain what is like to be in, in, in uh, there's a certain char phenomenal character, but doesn't represent anything. Okay. Uh, I mean, that's just uh, <coughs> as examples. So, if we talk about phenomenal character as a specific ingredient of the what is like uh, uh, to have a certain experience, uh, uh, then uh, we can talk about, if it exists, of course, uh, something like the phenomenal character ET, which is the phenomenal character of the feeling of the passage of time. So the phenomenal character of the pure passage. Okay. And of course, also, if it exists, uh, the corresponding representational content, representing the word 
as containing not just change, uh, qualitative, uh, sorry, qualitative change, motion, uh, and all other features, but also the passage of time. Okay? And of course, precisely because those are specific character, I want them to be distinguished by what I call experiences of uh, uh, temporal features, or to be more neutral, I will, call, I will just talk about T features, okay? uh, which are things like experience of change, experience of movement, uh, succession, uh, resistance, uh, and duration. Okay. So, how to account for the feeling of the passage of time? <coughs> Let me give an overview of the, of the positions. Uh, there is what I call uh, uh, the naive representationalism. Uh, that's a typo, sorry. This is a C, uh, T, not E, C. And uh, according to naive representationalism, uh, we experience, uh, uh, our, our experience as a, uh, have a, um, the passage quale, so to say, because uh, we represent the world as being uh, such that uh, time passes. So there is something like pure passage. This pure passage is represented by our, by our experiences, uh, and that's why uh, we have uh, uh, um, the feeling of the passage of time. Okay. Um, notice <coughs> that uh, uh, position like naive representationalism, although it doesn't entail neither realism nor anti-realism in, in, in uh, metaphysics, is definitely sympathetic with respect to the realistic position. Okay? Simply because uh, if you endorse realism, uh, you can say that uh, you can have an account of what is, uh, uh, you know, what is our experience of the passage of time in terms of a perception of that feature. So a veridical perception. How come that we feel the passage of time? Well, we perceive it. You know, it's, it's a very linear and neat uh, explanation. Okay. Then there are two other positions which I, I will not take into account today, which are basically uh, um, a position which are much more sympathetic with respect to the anti-realist account of, of, of uh, uh, sorry, anti-realist position in metaphysics. Uh, and according to those, uh, basically, what what explain uh, the dynamic uh, ingredient of our experience is given by the tensed format of our representation. Um, I don't want to talk about those uh, today. Um, just rough, uh, so roughly, my idea is that uh, those may be very good account of, uh, uh, of uh, what makes our experience uh, temporarily located and temporarily perspectival but are no starter for uh, an account of why our experience is dynamical. We can talk about the, that with respect to the uh, Q&A if you want. Um, other, another position which is, uh, uh, which as prominent as we see, but which is at least an account, a possible account of uh, uh, why our experience uh, uh, is dynamic is what I call reductionism. And according to reductionism and uh, um, um, ET, is somehow to be reduced to uh, experience of uh, uh, temporal fit or features of key features, um, at least in the minimal sense that uh, uh, experience of key features are responsible for ET, namely every experience of a temporal feature, let's say experience of, a, of, of something moving or something changed its, quality, its qualities, uh, uh, is also an experience that has uh, ET. So it's also an experience that has this dynamic uh, element in it. Um, notice that reductionism, as opposed to naive representationalism, is a much more friendly position with respect to the anti-realist, because uh, uh, the account that the reductionist gives of the, of the uh, experience of the passage of time is such that the only things that we need in the world are key features. RT features are perfectly kosher for, for the anti-realists. Uh, the the, the anti-realists just want to deny that passage, pure passage, is part of reality, not that temporal succession or, or, quant or, or qualitative change or movement are not part of reality. Okay. Um, and then we have the fashionism. According to the fashionism, uh, uh, the <coughs> um, the, the, the our, so our experience of the passage of time has to be accounted in terms of a sort of an error theory. So, according to the fashionism, 
experiences of the features are responsible, sorry, um, uh, we mistake experiences of the features for experiences uh, possessing ET. Uh, so basically, according to the Flashness, there is no such thing as a peculiar passage quality. There is no such thing as the sensation of the passage of time. There are only experiences possessing uh, L, um, um, phenomenal character corresponding to, oh, there's movement, oh, there's qualitative change, and these sort of things. Uh, but we mistake those experiences for mis experiences that, that tell us that time is passing. Okay. And then, according to the last position, which is the one that uh, uh, I want to defend, uh, um, the so the, the last position, uh, according to the last position, we should acknowledge the existence of ET, so of a specific uh, uh, quality of passage, but we should not account for it in uh, representational terms, neither in the sense of the, uh, the naive representationalism, nor in the sense of the reductionist, uh, but rather we should understand uh, the, this, this uh, uh, phenomenal character of passage uh, of a, uh, um, as a non-representational feature of the content. So a feature that modifies the way the content feels, but doesn't correspond to any representation of the world or how the world is like. Roughly as uh, when something happens to our eyes and our vision is blurred, we have an experience of, uh, uh, of the word uh, no, that feel. Blur blurry, uh, but we don't represent things as having boundaries as uh, indeterminate, as indeterminate. I will talk about this. So what's wrong with the uh, uh, naive representationalism? So quickly, uh, naive representationalism can't work, cannot work, neither whether realism is true nor whether realism is false. So. The idea is that uh, if realism is, is true, we have, uh, as we've seen before, the most natural interpretation of, uh, of, uh, of naive representationalism. So uh, if realism is true, the naive representationalism can say that uh, our experience has uh, ET because uh, we perceive it. But there are good arguments. I take, uh, in particular, Simon Prosser in a, in a couple of papers uh, has uh, elaborated uh, a very good argument to the fact that uh, uh, it is impossible to perceive uh, a feature like T. So even if uh, realism were true, uh, um, given any plausible uh, interpretation of how perception work, uh, works, um, uh, it would be impossible to have a detector of such a feature, and so impossible to perceive it. But even if anti, but of course a realist, uh, sorry, a naive representationalist uh, uh, need not be uh, a realist. Uh, so what about combine uh, uh, representation with uh, anti-realism? Uh, well, uh, if we do that, uh, so the, ex the experience uh, of the passage is explained as a perception illusion. Okay, we represent the word as possessing T, but as a matter of fact, uh, T is not around. Uh, but also, this, uh, this, uh, uh, this way out uh, is blocked because of uh, um, uh, what Chris Earl has uh, uh, named the intelligibility problem. So roughly, the intelligibility problem is that any account of uh, what the passage, what the experience of passage is like, should be such that uh, it make uh, the distinction in metaphysics between the realist and anti-realist position intelligible. Um, and in particular, uh, uh, if anti-realism is true, one has to make sense you know, uh, uh, of the distinction between a reality that does not possess T and the illusion that there is T. But if you go this way, then you, are, you have to say that this distinction is explained by there being a perceptual illusion that T is around. So that that, that we are, you know, perceptually mistake. But if process arguments are correct and we cannot perceive T, then we cannot uh, either explain uh, uh, the, the, the illusion of perceiving T as a perceptual illusion. So what about reductionism? Well, reductionism has not a problem, uh, as I said before, 
is a, is a reduction is a friend of anti-realism, so it's not uh, the problem to face uh, Prosser's argument, uh, but uh, it has still the problem of solving the intelligibility problem. So remember, the reduction says that uh, uh, there are you know, experiences that uh, uh, have a phenomenal character uh, corresponding to T features, take movement for instance, so there are experiences uh, that possess uh, EN. Uh, so for instance, the direct perception of the movement of the second end of a clock. There are experiences that lack uh, such uh, phenomenal character. Uh, this is uh, an example that, that, that dates back to, uh, to James. Uh, for instance, if I watch the hour end of a clock and I remember that it was, used to be uh, in another place, I don't have any experience of movement as when I directly see the, the, the hand, uh, the second hand moving. So the, this experience lacks that, uh, that phenomenal character. Uh, and there are experiences uh, with the uh, EM that are correct, as uh, the one that you just, just see. Uh, and there are experiences that are illusion. Uh, there are examples in ordinary life, uh, but an example that is made uh, often in the literature is, uh, is that of the uh, five movement. Uh, so basically the idea is that, uh, uh, which is known and studied since, since the 70s, uh, uh, basically the idea is that uh, if you are in a, in a completely dark room, there are two uh, light in front of you and uh, uh, one gets on and gets off, on and off, and above a certain threshold uh, you will see a dot moving. Okay, uh, so it's an illusion because nothing is moving there, right? it's just it's on, off, on, off. So there's no move, no continuous movement, but you see a dot moving, okay. Uh, so the, the idea behind reduction is, to, is precisely uh, that uh, well, a similar illusion uh, is around even when uh, we do veridically perceive movement with respect to the passage of time. So our, our brain tricks into there being passage, uh, even if there's no passage, exactly as it tricks into there being movement, uh, uh, even though there is no movement around. The problem is with this solution is that uh, uh, it is not a solution to the intelligibility problem because uh, the, the illusory cases of, uh, of movement, uh, of perceived movement, uh, are misperception of uh, uh, an object having a continuous movement and not uh, of a reality in which there is no T. So the kind of illusion uh, that uh, the, the reductionist uh, is concerned about here uh, um, cannot be exploited to explain uh, the, uh, the intelligibility problem, how uh, make sense of a reality possessing T and an illusion of us perceiving T. So what about deflation? Is of course, uh, deflation is, is tailor-made to get rid of the, of the intelligibility problem, so the, it not, doesn't even take off the ground in the deflationist uh, uh, setting because there is no, self, no perceptual illusion according to the deflationism. There is a cognitive illusion. We mistake you know, a sensation for another. So there's no problem of making sense of uh, uh, what is this perceptual illusion. But there is uh, what I take, what I call the origin problem. So the problem of explaining where does the ordinary belief that time passes arise. And why this problem is pressing for the deflationist? Well, because remember, uh, the deflationist cannot endorse the trivial answer to this, to this question. Because the deflationist weak, namely that, uh, well, no, the, this, the sensation of passage just is you know, what gives rise to this belief. No? Well, it's, it is the phenomenal character that, uh, uh, that gives rise to the, the common sense belief that time passes. But the deflationist, uh, According to the fashion, there is no such thing as ET. Okay? Uh, so he, he or she has to give us an explanation of uh, you know, why we mistake an experience of a T feature uh, for an experience that time is passing. Of course, uh, she can insist that, well, mine is an error theory, so the explanation is that we mistake this. <laughs> that's a, but I think that that's, uh, 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 that's not so satisfying, especially if you think that uh, the deflation is, has to endorse some sort of uh, uh, disjunctivist version of this theory, because uh, 
is not that we don't feel, uh, imagine the, the, the phi movement scenario below the threshold. Okay? So you don't have, you're, you're not tricking to there being movement, but you still feel the, fa the passage of time. Okay? So you have to say that it's not movement there here that trigger the passage of time sensation or belief, sensation I believe, uh, but, uh, 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 but for instance, qualitative change. So you need to be disjunctive, and then at this, this point, you need also to tell me, you know, what they have all these, these features in common that are such that they are all mistaken for the, for the, for the sensation of passage. Uh, okay, so uh, once we uh, get rid of the, those three rival position, uh, we can uh, endorse uh, the two main working hypotheses. The first one is just uh, that uh, uh, there is something like uh, ET, and the second one is that uh, uh, ET uh, is not connected to any uh, experience of temporal features because it's simply not connected to any other uh, uh, um, phenomenal character. It's something that is always uh, that all our mental episodes possess. Okay. Of course, uh, uh, one could try to argue against uh, uh, the second working hypothesis by way of uh, of uh, uh, um, thought experiments, uh, we can talk about that in the Q&A if you want. Well, my general point is that given that it is a working hypothesis here, uh, one should be careful about dismissing it uh, quickly on the basis of, of maybe on a thought experiment. Uh, I think that here, you know, we should look at it as a, in the context of a trade-off uh, between how, you know, uh, where it leads us. And so, uh, with respect to theoretical decision that concern other disciplines. And in particular, my defense is, uh, is based on the fact that it fits nicely with the, we know in the empirical literature, although I don't think I will have time to uh, go there. But anyway, so what's my position? Uh, so what a phenomenal modifier? So uh, let's call a worldly phenomenal character, a phenomenal character that, that, that corresponds to the what is like, uh, to have a mental episode with a content that represents the world as having a certain feature. Uh, so the question is whether there are any non-worldly phenomenal characters. Uh, and I've already given some examples, for instance, bodily pain or moods. But also uh, other characters that are clearly closer to the phenomenal content, but not so close to, to uh, I mean, but you know, which are such that it could still be plausible to think that they are not worldly. Uh, so for instance, in normal situation, we, don't, we, don't, we do not attribute to the entities represented uh, in the content of a blurred visual experience uh, 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 those very features. So we don't, we don't attribute to the, to, to the object you know, uh, being blurred or be having blurred boundaries. Um, so the idea is that a phenomenal modifier is a no word of feature or experience uh, that makes a difference for the way a concurrent mental episode with a content feels to us. And so typically has an influence on the belief based on the concurrent content. Of course, whether the belief is accepted or not may depend on broader factors. You know? For instance, if, if I'm in a scenario in which the, the setting is very uh, is such that my experience is very vivid. Uh, so I can say, oh, those colors are very bright. Uh, but then whether i willing or not to attribute this brightness to the, uh, uh, to the object or just to the setting, it might depend on, for instance, what I know or, or other factors, OK? So the idea is that uh, uh, we can have, uh, if we go, if we maintain the position according to which uh, uh, ET is a phenomenal modifier, uh, we can have uh, the cake and eat it too, so to say. So we can have all the benefit of uh, maintaining that there is uh, something like a peculiar feeling of the passage, uh, but also not running into the problem that all the uh, other accounts have. Uh, um, so uh, in particular, if we endorse the first working hypothesis, uh, um, and we are, uh, agree on the argument against representation in uh, reductionism. So we ha end up with the conclusion that ET is not worldly, which is the first part of the theory. And, uh, and we, if we endorse uh, uh, the second working hypothesis, then uh, uh, it's unlikely uh, that uh, 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 experiences with, of T features can be responsible for or mistaken for ET, simply because there are, you know, if all experiences have ET, uh, 
uh, then there are also experiences without the features with ET. Uh, so ET is a phenomenon modifier. Uh, uh, um, it has to be, uh, so it follows that it is also a phenomenon modifier of all experiences. That doesn't mean that uh, no, that's all we can say, or oh, it's just a primitive feature. Because uh, um, we can actually, I think it makes a lot of sense to investigate whether there is a cognitive mechanism underpinning ET and whether such mechanism is connected to other mental activities. And I think there are reasons that, uh, now I'm stopping because I already ran, of ta uh, I ran, out, I ran out of time, but just to give you an idea, there are reasons to think that this kind of theory connects nicely with the empirical evidence uh, with respect to uh, evaluation and so mis evaluation also of durations. Okay. And uh, so in the QA, I can run through some other slides, uh, but now it's thanks in the end. <laughs> us attributing um, blurriness um, to the object. Uh, and that, you know, once, once it's put that way, like it sounds more like a belief thing, like, yeah, it, you know, it might look blurry to me, but we don't attribute blurriness to that because, you know, we, for whatever reason. Um, I mean, yeah, from that, it doesn't follow that it's not still part of the content. Like, you might still say, well, even though we don't attribute blurriness to the object, our experiences um, make it seem as though they have that feature. Um, I mean, that's, that's how I think of it. Yeah, so, so I, I just I, I wanted to hear more about it. Yeah, yeah, no, of course. I mean, uh, well, to be fair, I mean, those are, aren't at all uncontroversial cases because uh, um, so if moods or, or possible pains uh, are, are more plausible, non representational feature of reality, of course, maintaining the blurriness is such. Uh, uh, is taking uh, sending a theoretical stance because uh, there are uh, representations that come to blurriness, you know, which according to which uh, when uh, when you see something uh, when you have like a, a blur your experiences experience you actually represent uh, uh, undetermined boundaries for those things, okay? and uh, that's why you can you know, make those judgments. Okay? Uh, so I mean, it's uh, I think it's a little bit of a trade-off uh, between uh, uh, what, you know, what make, so, uh, where should we put the feature? Or, uh, um, so uh, the, the appeal to the attribution uh, is just to say that so there is a uh, um, there is a sense in which. Uh, um, uh, one can maintain that uh, uh, when you blur visual experience, uh, there's no, there's nothing like, uh, uh, you know, having the sort of automatic <laughs> inclination to uh, to attribute to the object uh, uh, undetermined numbers, for instance, uh, as opposed to when you see something red, you may you may you know, even most. Uh, uh, like dark harder and realism with respect to colors, uh, but uh, your, in a sense, your experience is such that you know, tells you that this object is red. You have the common sense belief in that. And you might say, well, in the case of blurriness, it's not like that. Okay? And not just because we don't know. Uh, we know that it's something you know, funny <laughs> going into our eyes, but it's because it feels different. Um, I know, I mean, it's like, uh, 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 it's not, not down as, as, a, as a point, uh, but it's not uh, implausible to maintain that and see where, where that leads us. I he's trying to get our attention. So, Nick, do you have a question? Oh, I was, well, I do, but I was just saying hi, actually, that we're back. Uh, oh. <laughs> okay, hi. hi. So, can I ask? <laughs> so, um, about deflationism, I guess, which is what I think is right. And I think where we first met was probably I gave a talk in, in Barcelona a few years ago where I was, I mean, it was still a little unclear at that point, but I think I was arguing for a version of de deflationism 
then and the way you characterized it sounds exactly like what I think. So I guess I'll give an answer. My answer to that was be, well, you know, I, I like your questions and that I take that seriously. The answer is going to be something like, you know, poor philosophizing and theorizing about what's going on. You know, once you start to think about, oh, some of the, you start to sort of think about passage, you've kind of got a theory into which all these sort of disjunctive things will sort of slot and you can sort of see why people, you know, that might, people might uh, then end up, sort of, yeah, I guess taking everything as passage and how other, how, you know, when they communicate with one another, that might become a sort of more widely adopted sort of view. So I guess that's the sort of answer I would give. But maybe maybe okay. that's the trivial answer you were suggesting anyway. Okay. So you're saying that uh, you have a sort of pragmatic account of why there is a disjunction of, uh, of features that we all mistake for. Uh, so and it would be just because it, it's, it's easier to talk that way? Or <laughs> it, did I get you? Well, just, you know, once somebody, um, I should think of it in the sort of, um, you know, Baconian uh, um, fallacies, right? Sort of, once you sort of have a theory that sort of, a comp you start to sort of theorize about your experiences a little bit, it's easy to come up with a sort of bad theory about the character of your experiences. Um, and then once you have that sort of theory, it's very natural to sort of try to accommodate everything into that, into that theory. So the theory being that I'm sort of experiencing passage, I guess. Like people are pretty uncritical about intuitive theories. So. No, of course, of course. That's why I mean, I, uh, so I, I, I think that the kind of account that one has to end up with then has to fit as nicely as possible with all the uh, other data. That's, uh, uh, that's something that I take it as a desideratum uh, of the account. Uh, and I, I mean, I, I, I'm glad to say that, uh, so I, I've been flirting with the flash name as well. So I mean, it's a, it's, I think it's the best option. Uh, um, uh, so uh, it's the best alternative to what the alternative I'm defending. I still think that the problem with the flashing is that uh, it's it's the kind of account uh, that is that uh, the, the flashing has to give uh, of how the, the belief uh, rises. Uh, it's a little bit ad hoc uh, because uh, 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 you know if you take seriously the, the flashing is claim that there is no such thing as the thing of the passage of the pure passage of time. Uh, so why? Do we believe that uh, the time passes, and 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 it's not that. Uh, uh, so the, the reduction is the, uh, as other problem, I think, much more serious. But at least there, as an account, because it says, well, you know, the, the, the sensation of passage is to be reduced to to the t features, the experience of the t features. But every experience of the t features is also an experience with the uh, with this passage quality, because it is a. a uh, it is what the quality is basically. Uh, the, the deflection is that uh, if it's really a deflection, it cannot go that way. It really has to say that it's, it's a mistake. And uh, if, it's, if it's a mistake of, so uh, if it's one feature that, that we mistake it, uh, and well, that's just a default error theory, fine. <laughs> uh, but if it's like a disjunction of various features, uh, then I think that something is really missing. So if something should be that the theory should even just an error theory should be uh, you know enriched by an account of what have in common all those features that they all mistake, get mistaken for for the passage. Uh, it's not knocked down. I mean, I I, I agree that uh, flashiness is a is a is a you know, uh, is an option. Uh, uh, on the market, uh, uh, I'm just saying that uh, one could have, you know, one could doubt that that it can face a problem like that, and then let's see whether uh, another representation of this option uh, uh, right. uh, can fare better. 
Okay, yeah. we have a finger. Can I just, can, I just going to say one quick follow-up, follow up, which was just, I mean, I, I guess I'm, maybe I'm more, I will think about it, I'm kind of more comfortable with the disjunction. And, and in a way, I think I would be go, I'm happy enough to sort of I increase my disjunction to include in deflationism and the view that you're suggesting as well, that all of those things are going into the, I mean, I kind of agree, what you're saying sounds plausible to me as well. And, I would kind of take them together. Thanks. Yeah, maybe there's a way to, to, to fit them. <laughs> I mean, yeah, um, yeah, I wanted to, you know, I don't know anything about the philosophy of mind literature in this sense, but I wanted to you know, push back uh, in, on behalf of the flash in this myself. It seems like, so you, know, you, you end up with the, with the argument like, yeah, you have a big disjunction, so you know, there's no point. But it seems that it's not, there's a natural candidate to, you know, all the features that they have, all, that they have all, all the things in common, which is the one that we will think about. It's yeah, we'll change. Yeah. But it's change, right? The, the, I mean, you, you took, you took the, the, you know, the, the, you know, the example of the movement, there's nothing that moves there, but of course there's something that's changing. So it seems that change is the broader notion, and, and, and then from that we mistake the experience of change. The experience of passage of time. I think that that's the most natural. If you want to find a common feature, it's the natural. So suppose, for example, you know, Gabriel and McTaggart actually argue in the first slide that if you have a change in the universe with people who have a time universe, it seems that that's the same intuition that it's change. I mean, it seems a natural candidate. It's the only thing. It's a very yeah. broad thing. Uh, <coughs> yeah, I mean, like. Uh, Yeah, okay, because the idea is that they, ha they have to be all qualitative features. No? Like, like, again, because one could say, oh, okay, change, maybe it's good for quantitative change and movement, but secession, moderation, yeah, or persistence. Uh, but of course, uh, I agree that uh, yeah. that's not an answer because it's, well, they have to be you know, qualitative. Uh, exactly. Uh, so otherwise, uh, otherwise, you are just claiming that you are perceiving some sort of D. Uh, some exactly. Sort of, some so, sort yeah, that's D. Okay. Pure that's a feature, and you fall back to naive representation. Yes, so that's, yes. that's fine. Um, yeah, I mean, like, uh, so I think that one thing is to having a, a, a characterization of, of what they have in common the, from a theoretical point of view, and that, that I think that your proposal is, is the best of your proposal. Uh, and the other thing is to say what they have in common that is such that could, as experience, could explain that it also provides to the, uh, the cognitive uh, mistake. And it's not clear to me that just, you know, in just characterizing them as a all as a form of change uh, would be explanatorily sufficient here. Uh, so that's what I would ask. So I have a question as well, if you don't mind. So, uh, the, you, unfortunately, you had to skip over that part. You claimed in uh, some of the latter slides that uh, your view uh, is supported by empirical evidence, by findings in empirical cognitive science. Now, I would like to ask specifically about that, whether that is directly uh, evidence for your, in favor of your theory, or whether it is rather evidence maybe against some of these alternatives, but perhaps not all of them. In particular, I would be interested to hear how it fares vis-a-vis -vis deflationism, whether you know, deflationism wouldn't have a way of dealing with these empirical findings as well, and maybe even see them as confirmation for deflationism as well. Yeah, of course. Now, uh, uh, okay, let's, let's be, to be honest here. It's not, it's not even that they support my position. It's, it's, it's just that if you, I think that if one endorses my position, uh, can uh, 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 well make sense probably in a better way of uh, of, uh, of some part of the literature. And, and what actually I find more interesting uh, that uh, although that's of course, it's a sort of like uh, uh, claim that I'm making. Uh, is that uh, probably uh, it's, it's sort of like a, uh, it's a good way to look for. Uh, uh, so it's, it's at least a, a, so if you endorse 
the, the position and you look at the existing literature, the idea is that uh, you can see that there are distinctions that are, are not made by literature. And then uh, it could be interesting to, uh, to look into. Okay. So the, roughly, to be very, very shortly, the idea is the following, that uh, there is a lot of literature on uh, uh, misperception of duration. So not there are you know, misjudgments on uh, not very more and be that. But there are also misperceptions. So like uh, you are in a situation in which uh, you have a peak of dopamine because uh, you, know, you are under pressure, fear, or, or, uh, or of course certain drugs that do that. And uh, uh, you report that you felt or like a car accident. But there are also more controlled situations. And you report that you have experienced uh, those two seconds as lasting long. Okay. And uh, um, so the idea here is that there's a lot of literature on how, uh, or how we should account for, for the misjudgment, even it's clear it's not just a misjudgment, okay. but no literature, no literature at all for accounting for the different. Uh, uh, phenomenology. And my idea is that, well, if we assume that there is a, that, that, that the phenomenology of higher account is correct, then we can you know, plausibly maintain that there is a cognitive mechanism responsible for that, and that might interact with other things, like the dopamine levels, and then that would be an explanation of uh, both of why there is a different phenomenology and of uh, of why we, we judge because of, because of uh, precisely as when the light is very bright and we don't realize it, we might be discharged the, uh, the brightness of the color, so we might be in a similar situation there. That's, uh, uh, so I think that uh, it, it's not that the current literature provides support, then it's support. It's just that uh, if, you, if you put them together, uh, it looks like we can explain more. Okay. And that's if one is adapting <laughs> support. Right, sure, but, sure. Uh, sure. Uh, all right. Uh, so if there are no more questions, please join me in thanking Julia again.